morning, everybody. Right. right, so do we have a lot of youths here? Come on, older folks, we could put up our hands too, right? As long as in your mind and spirit, you are youthful, right? I'm right there. Okay, because this is about you all. It's TED Youth Talks, right, that we are dealing with. So I'm actually going to look at the importance of being irrelevant because we spend our lives being told what to do and the right things. And you think that great ideas emerge from universities, from classrooms, but trust me, many a great idea is born on the thorn, on the uh, throne, right, in our homes. All right, so you never know when a great idea will hit you, so be on the lookout for it. I give a lot of talks in schools, career guidance and that kind of stuff, and I'll have hundreds of students, and I will take a little poll, and let me take one right now. Anybody here wants to be a doctor? Anyone wants to be a lawyer? All right, right, I have my youth. You know, could you guys come up? I was seeing the young, young ones, and I wanted them to be closer to us. Right, so they could join us. Um, right, right, so we've got some doctors, some lawyers. Anybody, engineers? Okay, right. Now, typically when I'll go into a school and check that, I would have covered about 95% of the group of people I'm speaking to. Now, if all we could have is doctors, lawyers, and engineers, we will be in such serious trouble because every speaker with, before me was not one of those, all right? So does that mean that everything else is irrelevant? Do we not teach our children that, you know, it's okay to be a teacher, a driver, a doubles vendor? They do very well. There's a, you just look at life all around you and there's a range of careers spanning beyond being doctors, engineers, and lawyers, right? So who am I? As long as I could remember, I would look up at the stars and I wanted to be an astronomer. And that's the kind of response I got. What? Well, first of all, people thought I wanted to do astrology. Okay, could you guys tell the difference between astrology and astronomy? All right, meet me after, okay, if there's any issue. And if I mentioned it to anybody, that's how they would look at me. Suddenly everybody uh, transmuted into Mr. Bean, right? That's the look I got. I was told that, right? I was told, what are you going to do with astronomy? And worse yet, this is an actual statement that was made, right? In a board meeting when one tried to get funds for astronomy. You can't eat a telescope because it seems irrelevant for us to know about the universe and the world, or uh, the stars and everything away from our planet Earth. Even my own supervisor, before I got into and continued to my PhD in astronomy, told me it's not a good idea to do astronomy. But I had my hardened ways and I said thank you and joined anyway. All right, so yes, I am nuts. As most people who some, uh, go on to do things they're passionate about, I will say they are. The question I will ask you to ask yourself, that simple few words down there, what gives meaning to your life? All right, if for some people it may be money, well, that's fine. Go after it and make as much as you can. For some, it's a sense of fulfillment. For some, it's making a difference. There are, everyone has a different story of what gives meaning to your life. And I hope at the end of today, I mean, the other talks have been so inspiring, that you ask yourself that. For some, it's to create. For some, it's to dance. You talked about dancing. And you are programmed in a way, it's almost like a genetic coding in you to do some things. So that as much as you do what you think you should, your spirit is going to pull you right back to what you're coded with. If it's, you, you don't feel alive until if dancing is what you're created to do, if writing is what you're created to do, or art or anything, right? For me, it was astronomy. So many times someone feels, you know, I am doing really crummy in my exams. I can't be what I want to be and this and that. Well, I'm going to keep my talk short, but I have had periods of failure in my life, right? So you think, oh, okay, you want to do a PhD in astronomy, but no. At the end of the day, more than talent for anybody, and I have seen over and over, I'm in the profession of teaching. Thousands of students have passed through me. Hard work is your uh, golden egg. More than talent. You could have all the talent in the world, and you don't combine it with hard work, it ain't getting you anywhere. There's a book out that was, that's recently been out on the success of outliers, Malcolm Gladwell. 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 And he comes up with a simple number. And the number is 10,000. What is 10,000? 
10,000 stars, $10,000. It's 10,000 hours of work that's required to become an expert in anything. And then when you study the lives of successful people and you think, wow, they suddenly reached a success and they're in the news and they're so young, how did they do it? But if you track their lives carefully, you're going to see that the story started a long time ago. And in both my previous, two of my previous speakers before me, I saw that trend. It didn't happen when they, two days or a year before they stood up here, but it was a journey that was within them that they followed through since they were children. In all my talks, I'm actually coming up with a magic age. What you are exposed to between seven and 10 often could make your life, which is why we have a responsibility, not just to the youths, but to the children, okay? And what we expose them to. So this is my message for you. Follow your dreams and the universe will open doors for you where there were only walls. Is it true? Yeah. All right, I'm a scientist, so how can I say that that's true? Uh, because I have seen it far too many times. Far too many times I've had a student in my office crying. They have a dream, they don't have a clue, they don't have the money, they don't know how they're gonna do it. And then years later, knock, 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 miss, doc, whatever they call me, um, guess what? X, Y, and Z happen, and I am here doing what I always wanted to. So those of you that are youths, that are young, and you wonder, how am I going to get to there? Have faith, okay? Those of us that are a bit old, and I can't understand how you know about beta recorders. That is before your time, young man. <laughs> All right, so a little stealing a few words from Edgar Allan Poe. Experience has shown, and a true philosophy will always show, that a vast, perhaps the larger portion of the truth arises from the seemingly irrelevant. All right, so irrelevant is an opinion. The importance of daydreaming. Daydreaming is where we start to build our futures. Now in class, if you're daydreaming, you're probably gonna get a chalk belt or you, at you or thrown out of the classroom. But you are actually engaging in a very important exercise. Irrelevant thought. Has anyone ever had that thought? I wonder what it would be like to travel on a beam of light. I teach physics. It's right up my alley. And I would always take a poll in my class before I start a particular course. Has anyone had that thought? I have never yet met anyone who has had that thought. Well, one gentleman did have that thought. All right, everyone recognizes him. Okay, so Albert Einstein daydreaming in a job where he was very bored, he was a clerk in a patent office, had that thought. And while it will take an entire course to explain to you the implications of that single thought, suffice it to know that's the birth of special relativity. All right, so Albert Einstein is so famous that what have we got here? Oh. All right, so we don't just have action figures of Wolverine. You can actually get an action figure of Albert Einstein, right? So there's my goodie bag. That's why that was there. <clears throat> and then there was this high school dropout. These are his actual words. I was a very sickly child, suffering from allergies, and I used to get very high fevers, and that had me quite backward in school. But I was never academically inclined. I had always loved the arts and he dropped out of school. You recognize him? Folks, that is, thank you, right? McFarlane, Brian McFarlane, right? Genius, artist, mass maker in our country, right? He's a high school dropout. And he even got into a design school in Miami and his parents told him that, Brian, we can't afford to send you. And he couldn't go, but the passion, the more than 10,000 hours in the lives of all these people that have made it. Watch that. And then, so all of these stuff that we are saying, what we are saying is live as if you matter. Sticky notes, my sticky notes, where did that go to? I have, you know, Felix used to have a magic bag. Looks familiar. We could barely live without it, those of you that are working or in an, in an office environment, right? Well, did you know that it came from a failed experiment? These folks were trying to create a super strong glue and they were just having a bad day. The glue just wouldn't stick. It wouldn't stick. They were so frustrated. So actually it was a friend who took it 
and said, hey, wait a minute, this makes a perfect temporary page marker in hymn books. And today, it's history. That's how the post-it was invented. And why is it yellow? Well, it's as irrelevant and random as anything. The yellow was chosen by accident because the lab next door had scrapped yellow paper. All right, so life is full of things that we don't pause and think about. Oh, I got my own um, paper wrap, uh, right, bubble wrap, right? Everybody knows this far too well, and if you get a package, you don't usually throw this away. I would actually take it out of the package and put it in a drawer because I don't know when I would need to pack something. And you never know when you need it for that day, right? You've had a bad day, right? It makes a great stress buster. Well, bubble wrap story belongs to two engineers, decided to do a, I imagine, a business venture. And they said they'd seal two shower curtains together, and they tried to market this as wallpaper. And you're thinking, duh. Well, if you think that something like that would fail, well, guess what? It did. It failed miserably until IBM ran into it. Oh, there it is, right? <laughs> it makes great music, too and realize what great packaging, protective packaging it does. And these are now million, billion dollar industries from mistakes, from irrelevance. And now we've got a picture there. There's a lady, there's Africa, that's actually Ghana in yellow, and to build. So can anybody make a connection between those three things? All right, here's another clue. There's another, the word to build comes from Swahili. Anyone recognizes this, right? Jenga. The word Jenga is a Swahili word, which means essentially to build. And this is Leslie Scott. She was in Africa as a child with her parents working. Well, the parents were working there. She grew up in Africa. And from the sawmill, they would get these little leftover blocks of wood. And she started stacking them. And that's your origin of Jenga the number two selling game in the world after Monopoly. How irrelevant. We may tell our children, well, what are you doing? You know, clean up your room. You're leaving all these little pieces of blocks all over. But look what it could lead to. And this seems a little bit more literally in our backyards, right? How many of us, the mangoes and the coconuts, and you could drive around the savannah for your coconut. We are all in Port of Spain this morning. And that's the story of Keshorn, our own hero, right? And as his folks said, it's only a few years ago that he's been having the real actual training for the javelin that he went on to do us so proud with. But maybe he clocked 10,000 hours as a, from a childhood. They say he was always pelting mangoes and coconuts and making a great day. How many of us parents might buff up our children and say, child, what you pelting mangoes for? Get in there and get to your books. What would we have done? If we had told a question, don't pelt mangoes and coconuts. All right, so to all visionaries and risk takers, do you all recognize that gentleman? Steve Jobs, we recognize him too well. And I love the words from him. And as I wrap up, I want to share his words with you. Your time is limited. So don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinion drown out your own inner voice. And most importantly, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. And that's my message to you in three words. Accept your irrelevance. And now, let me see how many risk takers I have in the audience. All right, I'm going to walk off my red block for just a few seconds. We want a few risk takers, and it's always the young people that are the wonderful folks. Come on, anybody else who's a risk taker, come on up. Right? Risk taking is doing something and having no idea what we're getting ourselves into and what's going to happen. Right? So let's see what risk these folks have taken. <laughs> music. Wait, the music. <laughs> Right? <laughs> excellent, excellent, cool. Totally irrelevant, but total fun. You want to join us up here too? <laughs> All right, you. Come on, some more guys. Right? Excellent.
Ah. Ah.